and it's Joe, not Joseph. Well, my name is Joe, it's not Joseph. Okay, this is May 15th, 1987. This is Joe Todd and Bernice Jackson, an interview with Dr. Joe Leslie Dewar in Woodward, Oklahoma. Dr. Dewar, where were you born? I was born in Dewey County, down in the center of the county, south of Lenora, about seven, eight miles. When's your birthday? March 20, 1905. 1905. Who is your father? Willis Dewar was my father, and uh, my mother was uh, Sylvia Tarr. T-A-R-R? T-A-R-R. Where were your parents from? Father was uh, born in Iowa, but he grew up in, in northern Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they came to northern Kansas when he was about four or five years old, mm -hmm. and that's where he grew up. And mother was born in Kansas uh, and uh, spent most of all her lifetime in Kansas till she was married down here to my father and then of course spent the rest of her life there. Why did your parents move to Oklahoma? Well, uh, the old uh, store, dad came down to pick up land. He, he homesteaded here in 1900 down there. Of course that was some time after the land run, but uh, there was still land available. And uh, he had to do quite a bit of looking around to find a, a plot, but finally found one. And somewhat of interest, I always thought, <coughs> a couple of boys went to work down there and homesteaded on a section and divided it up to, in such a manner that they, there wouldn't be 160 left. And of course their idea was that later on they would uh, claim this land because it wasn't enough for a homesteader. But uh, over in the next section across there, uh, they left 40 acres over there. So by putting that 40 with the uh, uh, other 120 over in this section, father was able to make out 160 acres. They weren't very happy about it, but there wasn't much they could do about it. <laughs> what did your father have to do to prove up the claim? I don't recall all of the details on that. They, 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 they he had to, of course, uh, live uh, on the place and uh, start improvement. And, and those things, and it cost him a dollar an acre, uh, and uh, I think it was for, for five years, five years I think it was, Dad. I don't remember all of the details of that old homestead law. That's, of course, historical anyway. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, he, uh, of course, when he filed on the claim, he immediately moved on, and started work building an old dugout and getting wells and fences and so on, and uh, proved up the claim that way. Then, so, what yeah. kind of, oh, go ahead. Hey, pardon. What kind of house did your parents live in when you were born? Half dugout. Not only when I was born, but as long as we lived down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same old half dugout. How large is that half dugout? I uh, dug down in the bank, so to speak, about uh, halfway of it down, and then built up from there up uh, above the bank. Uh, Father, uh, I don't know where he got the idea, but he took the old dip rock and crushed it up and burned it, and uh, made a mortar, a dip mortar, and run this mortar up as walls on the house uh, below the ground. And then uh, from there up, it was frame house uh, above the ground. How many square feet inside? The, uh, um, I can't give you those exact figures. Uh, I'm not real sure. There's a something like 16 by 24 
or something of that kind. Uh, I have a picture in there that I painted in the old place, mm -hmm. but uh, that was about what it was. And then it had a half attic up above, which, uh, uh, as the family grew up, with some of us slept up there. But it was uh, not completely completed, never was complete, completed. What kind of furnishings did you have inside the dugout? Meager. That's as good an answer as I can make it. <coughs> I can't, uh, of course, recall in the beginning. When I was born, uh, we had no floor. It was later put in a, a, as a floor. Uh, I have one sister older than I am, but before my next brother, next young to me, why they had put in a floor. Uh, I can't recall, of course, all the details back then. Then when I was uh, six years old, in 1911, five years old, actually, 1910, I should have said rather than 11, father got a message that his, his father in, up by Smith Center was not expected to live. So we went up there to see my grandfather and uh, got on the train over here at Curtis. That was my first ride on the train. Mm -hmm. And of course for a little five-year-old kid, you can imagine how, how, how we took on about that. When we got up to Downs, Kansas, 24 five miles from where grandfather lived, we were met by one of his neighbors in an automobile, and that was our first ride in an automobile, and there's some more bug-eyed kids, <laughs> and uh, a Vili automobile, and uh, had old acetylene lights and hard tires, and set way up high, and that was in December, and it was pretty cold, and they bundled us kids up in buffalo rugs, and they were real buffalo hides, and there no makeshift about it and took us over there. Then my father decided since he was the oldest child, grandfather passed away in March after that, but he decided since he was the oldest child it, it might be better if he stayed up there and helped grandmother and the other boys, younger boys, get in the spring crops and get out to harvest as well as grandmother getting her estate settled up. And grandmother's estate settled up at about $10,000, which was pretty good estate for that time. And uh, what she did, and then in September, uh, he and a couple of other fellows, George Redinger and <coughs> Bill Redinger from down here by Sealing, made up a wagon train and we come back to Oklahoma in a covered wagon. So that was another first, and that puts me, I think, as a very bona fide covered wagon traveler. It wasn't no Chamber of Commerce uh, program or anything. Tell me about that trip in a covered wagon. About two weeks long, and of course I was six years old by then, uh, and that was in 1911. Uh, and that's that's a rather interesting for the, from our standpoint that we had three wagons, one that our family was in, one wagon that uh, Bill and George uh, made as their headquarters, and then a third wagon as a feed wagon for the horses, and so on. We had a team. We had three teams. We had four teams but they led one team because we didn't use them very much. And uh, we made about uh, approximately 20 miles a day. At that time, of course, Kansas was well settled and well uh, populated, you might say, and with reasonably good country-type roads, no pavement, and so on. And uh, also of interest, uh, always has been to me. Bill 
riding her in the front wagon, had a little yellow pencil. Every time we passed an automobile, he made a mark on the, on the overjet, keep tabs on those. 125 automobiles in two weeks. And uh, you pass that much, many of them going from here to ceiling almost, but now, you know. But of course, you took two weeks to do it, you pass a lot more than that. <laughs> so that was uh, somewhat interesting. And one, one motorcycle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what kind of food did you have in the wagon train? What? What type of food did your mother fix on food? the wagon train? Well, of course, we always, we'd stop the, uh, along and buy milk from the farmers, eggs where we could get it, generally butter, and uh, then of course we could, uh, we had uh, just uh, uh, old basic food, some meat once in a while, bread and gravy, <laughs> and potatoes, but very, very basic uh, food. We, there's nothing fancy about it. We had, we, uh, we uh, had a, a relatively comfortable trip in so far as the weather was concerned, except we got into one big rain up at Pratt, Kansas. Like to drown us all out, but uh, we made it through that all right. Uh, we had to ford the Salt Fork up by Alva, the river. Of course, then we're back in Oklahoma at that time, and uh, then our uh, the the to me one of the most outstanding and memorable things I can remember about the whole trip coming south from Winoka over to the old Greaver Canyon, and uh, the the old roads marked us off down through there. And normally, before, they'd get down there and then they'd take off around through the country and cross these canyons where they could. But the homesteaders uh, come in there and built their fences on the section line, so that forced the road to go to the section line. And the section line that went down to the old Greaver Canyon was uh, uh, no such thing as a road. We got there on the banks of that canyon, and it's a very large canyon. If you don't think so, go and follow the road down, you see. We got there at night, in the evening, and uh, the men were camped, and the men discussed the situation. We would have to go probably 25 or 30 miles following back double and back and so on to get across. So they decided they'd cross the canyon there. And they did. It took them all day. We got across the next day. They'd lock the wheels, tie the wheels on the wagon, and uh, put on ropes and have chunks of wood, slide that wagon, virtually slide a wagon to the bottom, then come back up and get the next wagon and then to the next and so on. We were all down the bottom for lunch. Then they'd hook eight head of horses on a wagon and go up the bank on the other side. Go over to the horses, get tired, and throw a chunk under the wheel and stop and rest. And then we camped that night on the other side of the canyon. It took us all day to get across. How the wide is that canyon? I would guess that uh, there it's uh, a, a, a good quarter of a mile, but I'm, I'm sort of guessing. Uh, for me, uh, it, it seemed to me like I, uh, it was a good quarter of a mile, and I know when they get down in the bottom, we look down there, it seemed like the horses and wagons were toys. They, they were sort of far down in there. Uh, Has it, anybody else ever crossed right, right there at that? So I do not know. There was no track across there. We made tracks. You made tracks. I don't know whether anyone else followed them or not, but I do not know that. Uh -huh. But we went across. Where did you sleep during the wagon trip? Uh, we had uh, a bed fixed up for my, uh, 
father and mother and the small children. There were five of us children at that time. And then uh, we had a bed in the bottom of the uh, wagon for the rest of us. Pile down in, pile down in there, and uh, that that's uh, that was the way we we just sort of shacked up. It was a good way to put it, I guess. Now, how did you know where you were going? Were the roads marked in any way, or? Well, all across Kansas they were marked. They were section line. There's no problem. All across Kansas. What about Oklahoma? Yeah, but when and then when they got to Oklahoma, of course, it was simple enough. To uh, the main road on from Kiowa to Alva and on to Winoka, no problems. <coughs> then when we start across from Winoka down to Chester, that's where we run in out of roads. Of course, when we get to Chester, well, then there's roads going to the other places, and uh, so they they were they were uh, opened up and that there was no problem. We didn't have any cross-country roads, you know. The, uh, the, uh, all the roads, as I say, in Kansas were open. The, the, uh, and also where we went in Oklahoma, they were open, except this one across there. So that was always a very interesting uh, episode in my younger life that, that we, uh, like this covered wagon trip, uh, getting out and cooking over that old campfire, and uh, uh, what kind of work did your father do? He was, uh, of course, basically a farmer, but uh, he he worked out uh, uh, a good part of the time. He he was uh, the most consistent work that he did is. Uh, came along was operating a, a, a thrashing machine. Uh, he he uh, ran uh, the, the thrashing machine for I guess 15, 20 years uh, for these, of course he was hired out. He didn't own it, but he hired out for that. He knew it. Uh, in northern Kansas, before he came down here, he had uh, uh, run the engine, steam engine, but uh, they got down here, They got, by that time the old steam engines were going out, the, the gasoline engines were beginning to come in. The first thrashing machine that I saw was horse drawn, it was pulled by horses and run with a horsepower machine. And our old thrasher, the broom corn cedars were run by horsepower, the first ones, and, uh, and so on like that. We raised quite a bit of broom corn down in those country then. How and big, uh, how big a machine? <coughs> how big was the thrashing machine? How big was it? Uh -huh. how big well, uh, uh, I couldn't uh, answer that, but I'm sure later on when I got big enough to heave wheat myself, why, about the smallest one they had was a 21-inch, and I'm sure that this one was uh, not any more than that, maybe a 20-inch uh, 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 cylinder. Mm -hmm. uh, then when you get up into the 36 and 38 inches, well, those are real old hogs, and you couldn't, you couldn't throw in too much of them, <laughs> as small ones you could. When did you start to school? I started to school. <coughs> Right after we got back from Kansas in 1911, my sister and I both started your school there. Uh, <coughs> of course, in a way, they started your school. I, I was reading everything I was getting my hands on by that time anyway. I learned to read in two or three years before my sister could read also, for that matter. And uh, so uh, uh, we, we started down the old Raymond Schoolhouse, which is uh, eight miles south of uh, Lenora, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, the most spectacular thing of that first year 
that I always remember and it brought back to me uh, annually, you might say, on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1911. Look at your weather reports. I went to school that morning in my shirt sleeves. The weather was 80 degrees, up to 80 degrees. Before 3 o'clock it was down near zero and the wind coming in from the north just howling and it went to about zero that night. And uh, if you'll follow, uh, follow the record re the weather report, you'll find that that day had the highest temperature that's ever been recorded in Oklahoma and the lowest temperature that's ever on for that one day. And how far did you have to walk to get Two home? miles. Two miles. However, we didn't walk home that night. Father came after us and, and got us. He came down with the wagon and hay in the bottom and plenty of comforts and hauled uh, not only my sister and I, but the neighbor's kids that were there the same way we were. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, mm -hmm. the teacher got us in the house and built a fire and wouldn't let anybody out. Because she, he knew that uh, that's the only thing he could do. Mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't have any business starting out two miles north, west, no, I think so. against that kind of a, 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 mm -hmm. of a blizzard. And he was smart enough to know. How that. deep did the snow get that time? Not very much. Not very much. Not very much. Uh, it was uh, what there was was drifted, but mm -hmm. there was no great large drift. Mm -hmm. And I always remember that as happening my first year in school. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I'm reminded of it every year. Mm -hmm. And you watch the weather reports, 11th day of the 11th month of the 11th year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how far was uh, this Leonora from uh, Grand, old Grand? Quite a ways. <coughs> Quite a ways. It's about... Uh, 16 miles from Lenora to Camargo and then old Grant was on I'm not sure another another 16 20 25 miles oh, from Camargo right. mm -hmm. on up the river from mm -hmm. Camargo mm -hmm. we were down on the old uh, uh, in the bend of the old South Canadian River yes. down there and uh, uh, so uh, that, that was about that the uh, uh, we went uh, after that. So far as schooling was concerned, we uh, we went on to through the grade school there, and I finished the eighth grade, passed the whole county examination. The year I was uh, uh, thirteen years old. Wow! And uh, so the folks thought I was a little small to send off. To 16 miles to Lowe's High School for that, and uh, I thought so too. So I laid out of school for three years. But I'll tell you something there then. Uh, then I went back into school when I was about 16. My sister and I went. She had already gone to high school, so my sister had. And uh, we, uh, they had a high school two-year high school, uh, well, it really a four-year high school, but they'd started up at Lenora, mm -hmm. Hill Lenora. And my sister and I uh, went to high school there, and we made up the first graduating class. We were the whole thing, <laughs> two of us in the yes. class. I always say that, which was true, she was a valedictorian, and I was a salutatorian, mm -hmm. and I wanted it strictly understood that I was a salutatorian. That's better than saying that I was at the foot of the class. <laughs> 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 I thought that sounded better anyway. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, what year did you graduate from high school? What year did I graduate from high school in 1924? 1924. <coughs> I got a job teaching school then. I got a teacher certificate permit, 
and I got a job teaching at Trail, Oklahoma, uh, which is right across the river south of Camargo, and it's another defunct old town. I taught there one year. I taught the seventh and eighth grades uh, at Trail, Oklahoma. I like to teach, but it uh, it didn't offer enough for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see that much of a future mm -hmm. in it, and uh, so I made up my mind that uh, if I was going to do anything else except look at the south end of this old team of mules, I had to get out and get going. Mm -hmm. And so in 1925, I took off and went to Norman and enrolled in the University of Oklahoma mm -hmm. in 19, working my way through. And I worked my way through every stitch of it. How did you, what kind of jobs did you have? The first year I was down there, in the beginning, I took any kind of a job I could get. The only job I turned down was unloading coal, and I turned it down because I couldn't make enough of that to pay for the clothes that I'd use. And uh, I worked in the yards and uh, had, a, had a job of firing a furnace for the boarding house, and uh, as, as I say, odd jobs. I worked on on uh, uh, staining a roof on one house, for example. Then I began to doing yard work, and, and uh, I built me up a quite a more work than I could handle of that, and farmed it out to some of the other boys that needed it. And then, then uh, my friend Buster Boatman uh, had it. Uh, job in the old copper kettle, and uh, he found out that there's an old man across over there on White Street, had a little hamburger joint, and he wanted somebody to help him out. I went down and looked at him, and the old man hired me, and I got, got a job there then, uh, right after the first of the beginning of the second semester. I, I was hard up. I I, uh, I don't know why, and no one else can tell me why. But I came down in the, say the first of December. I took an inventory of what cash assets I had, and I figured that if I could say it had me enough to enroll in for the second semester, mm -hmm. I'd rise myself at fifteen cents a day, which I did. So that I would have enough money to enroll for the second semester, I got a little hungry. Well, what was the uh, what? what was the tuition fee? What was the tuition fee? Oh, it wasn't too high. I don't remember, uh, but it wasn't too high. It cost me, <coughs> I'd say twenty-five dollars, but I'm picking that out of the air. But it wasn't any higher than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how near broke I was. Did you live on campus or off campus? What? Did you live on campus or off campus? Off campus. Where? Uh, well, uh, wherever I could find a place. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I started about uh, in, a, in a boarding house, then I got this job uh, firing a furnace and I got a room for, there, for that. Then when this old man uh, with a cafe, hamburger joint, when when uh, I took over that job, why well, he had a room in the back, so I got my room and board for for helping him run this hamburger joint, and he liked that idea pretty good and wanted to sell me the joint. Well, I didn't have no money to buy none. <laughs> I could, well, it sounded sort of crazy, but. The banker back home had told me if I needed any help, let him know, so I thought I'd find out about it. I wrote to him about it and told him kind of what I had in mind. Uh, the, the old man offered to sell it to me for $50 down and pay it out the rest of the month by payments. And I didn't have the $50, 
and the banker didn't even answer my letter, and I quit banking with him. I've never banked with him since. <laughs> and he wouldn't even answer my letter. Made me mad, made the old man mad. He said, well, I've got more faith in you than that. He said, I'll raise the price $50. He's going to sell me the equipment he rented the house for $150. And he said, I'll raise the price $50 and sell you the equipment for $200 plus interest. And I think we'd pull 5% interest or something like that. Wasn't very much. And uh, with nothing down. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, turn that down. But even if I flunked out, I had that much more education behind me. I had a place to live, I was getting something to eat. I bought it. And I made out very well. Uh, by rationing myself and uh, uh, why I was able to make the payments and keep all the payments up and uh, coming out and build up business. Got better, better business. The biggest deal I got in then was selling hamburgers at the state high school track meet. I got a, I got a, a deal with the student uh, council. They came to me and wanted me to make a bid. I told them I couldn't make no bid on that. I didn't have nothing to back me up on. And uh, they kept after me and wanted to know if I could make a bid, what kind of a bid I would make. and, and I, and uh, told them I couldn't bid more, and I said, uh, what's the matter with what you had before? Well, uh, they didn't think they were treated right, and uh, they they wanted somebody that they felt like could be honest. So uh, they finally said, well, do you think you could, uh, could live on $50 for the franchise? I said, yes, I, I think so. If you don't make me pay it till afterwards, well, okay. So I got that, uh, got that, I call a franchise, a good way to any, to sell the hamburgers out there to take oh, track meat. Wait a okay. Got me a little outfit and set up business out there, and I cleaned up for good. Pretty good. I took in. Uh, I took in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars for the three, yeah. which was a big deal. Yeah. I could very well afford them their fifty dollars, which I paid them. What was the name of the place? Uh, your your hamburger. Well, that, it didn't have any name right then. Come up later, did have which we'll get on here with. What, what was the location of that place? That was on uh, uh, White Street. White Street. The north and the campus corner of a block. That's where it was. And anyway, these boys came back afterwards and I paid them and they said there's one thing that one knows said uh, 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 how much did you make? And I said, I don't think that's any of your business. And they said, well, well one other thing then, maybe you can answer. If you paid us 10%, if you paid us 10%, uh, could you come out? And I said, yes, very well. Would you made any more than you did? I said, quite a considerable. <laughs> that's all we wanted to know. But I never was able to get it back. Of course, then <coughs> coming on, I had closed it up at the end of school. Of course, I didn't think it would uh, mm -hmm. pay to run through the summer. The old boy I rented the place from promised me he'd fix up the place. And uh, then uh, when I come back in the fall, I, I could start up. In the meantime, I went to work back in the harvest field in one place or another, making my, kept my payments up to the old man. In that fall, then, this friend of mine, Buster Boatman, 
Hey, Brown wanted to buy in with me. I wanted him to go in before, but he didn't. And uh, want to, but he wanted to buy in with me. So I sold him half interest for what I was out. And we started in together. Went back down there, and the old man hadn't done a darn thing. Place was lousy and messed up and what have you. So the salesman put me on to a place, and I uh, made quite a story out of that one. Uh, uh, Mrs. Tace, Tatoius, <coughs> over on West Boyd. She had a little place over there. She sold sundries and papers and pencils and so on like that. And she had it, and uh, it came under the grandfather clause when they zoned the place. It had to be set up as a business place because the business there. So she had this little place, and the uh, salesman had told me if I could get that place, I could clean up. So I went over to see the old lady about it. She wasn't very receptive. She had rented it before to some students and thought they'd got to her and so on. And I talked with her and uh, had it on a Friday night and talked with her and uh, didn't seem like I was getting anywhere. So finally the idea struck me and I said, would you mind telling me when you rented this how much you got for it? And she said, well, no, I don't mind. I got $25 and, they, and, I, and I paid all the utilities. And there I was sitting over at this other place paying $35 and all of my utilities, see. So I told her, I said, well, I tell you what I'll do, I'll give you $30 and pay all the utilities myself. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> I said, well, that's my part of the bargain. Well, she, she didn't quite think that would work out so good. But she talked to her husband and for me to come back then Tuesday night. Okay. Well, <coughs> we felt like that we probably were going to get somewhere, so we were ready. I went back then on Tuesday night, and uh, she and her husband, had, he was a railroad man. And uh, he'd been in on his run over the weekend. And uh, they had decided that they'd let me have it. But uh, they would pay the water bill because it was on just one, one meter and I could pay the others. I said, that's fine, so very well. I paid them a month's rent. She said, when, when do you plan on moving in? I said, we'll serve breakfast in the morning. <laughs> she, she, she thought that was going some, but we were ready. We knew we would. Got a hold of my salesman, and we had a drayman waiting, moved her material over there. <coughs> and the next morning we had coffee aroma up and down the street, and boxes of hot rolls, and uh, that was breakfast. And we sold, we served more that day, made more money that day than we had any other one day ever over at the other place. Now, the name of that place then was, uh, it was right across the street from where the old Gamma Phi Beta house was, a little brown house and a uh, glass in the window and the glass in the door. And one of the Gamma Phi Beta girls said, it is odd to look over there at night and see that little old house. Those lights in this are just look like a little old brown owl something over there. So that was the name of the place, the brown owl. Well, yeah. And that uh, place then uh, stayed there as a brown owl for years and years, up until not very many years ago. What street was? What street that on? Has on West Boyd. West Boyd. West Boyd, just a block west of the, uh, of the campus. And all the time you were attending classes. Oh yes, yes, attending classes, sure. And uh, but we made too much money. The old lady wouldn't run us back to us. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> she, she gonna put her boy in there. That she, they found out hamburgers was a good business, mm -hmm. and uh, we averaged 
gross hundred dollars a day, which for, for poor boys was pretty good money. Of course, I say gross, but that would still net us thirty, mm -hmm. at least thirty dollars a day. What was your major at the university? Well, there's a good interesting story. Let's go back on that thing. I didn't know what I wanted to take. I just knew I wanted to go to school. I wanted to get an education. I wanted to be something, do something. I had scouted around. You know, at that time, uh, they didn't have all these uh, counselors and what have you that I have today. And these poor old country kids like us, we didn't know anything about what kind of work there was. The only professions we knew anything about was medicine, and I swore and be damned many times I never would study medicine. <laughs> medicine and, and teaching mm -hmm. and uh, pharmacy, law, those are the only ones we come in contact with. We knew there was engineers, but we didn't come in contact with them, such as that. That's about all we knew about. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I enrolled in pre-law when I started. But by the end of the first semester, I was certain I didn't want to be a lawyer. I couldn't at that time, I could now, but I couldn't at that time uh, understand how I could defend someone for a crime that I knew he had committed. And uh, I, could, I can understand it now because I'm, uh, he's not guilty until they prove he is guilty, and my business is to make them prove it. But I couldn't see that then, and I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. So I didn't know what I wanted to be, so I enrolled unclassified. And uh, taking general courses, of course, a little of this and that. And uh, then I started a program. Uh, if I had an hour off, I went to some class or school, walked in and sat down and attended the class. Mm -hmm. And see whether I liked it or not. Mm -hmm. I went to all the classes, engineering classes of all kinds, geologists, pharmacies, chemistries, and uh, at that time the first two years of the medical school was down there. And I thought, well, uh, I better go give them a try. I, I know I don't want it, but they might have something in there, some ideas, they give me some ideas. So I went to the medical school and sat in on medical school classes. And uh, so every time I had an odd hour, I went to some class in some of these others. It comes time that, uh, that I'm going to have to declare myself. So I sit down and take an inventory to see what I'm doing. And nobody was more surprised than me to find out that when I had an hour off, I beat it over to medical school. For that, I, I thought, well, better face your music. If that's what you're interested in, you better get it. And that's where I started in the, in the medical school and, and, uh, and uh, went in then as a pre med, pre medic. And uh, so it cost me a, an extra year, but not that wasn't nothing. I got in with three years of work. I could have got in with two, but I got in with three years of work. None of them, they still on the books that they can get in, but none of them ever gets in with less than a degree anymore. There are too many applicants, you know. So then when I went to medical school, <coughs> started in there in 1928, and that was the first year that all four classes of the medical school were given in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, before, they'd given two years at Norman, and then the last two years at Oklahoma City, but they built the new medical school up there in 19, and I went in there in 28. And uh, so we had to start in. They told us that they wanted to 
overlap classes and so on so, uh, with since they were all together and they had to do some overlap and somebody had to take it so we just as well take it mm -hmm. so we got it and uh, my first year in medical school we carried as much work as uh, the first year and a half previously Normal. The casualty rate was high. There's at least 50% of the class didn't make it. Uh, as I say, the casualty rate was high. From then on, it wasn't quite so difficult. The, uh, <coughs> but there's where. I ran into some of the toughest part of my whole time in school. <coughs> As I said, uh, I had to take another year at Norman down there and I got job cooking and uh, dishwashing and things like that and made it through. They run us out of the, I didn't have the hamburger joint back. <laughs> So I made it through there. Then when I go to Oklahoma City, I'd had a bad summer, rained me out a lot in the harvest field, didn't make a whole lot of money. And I uh, I went down and enrolled in medical school. I got paid room rent for two m weeks. and. Uh, counted my change, I had seven dollars and fifty cents to go to school on, and no job. But I was optimistic. I never had any trouble finding a job, something. I started hitting the pavement. At the end of two weeks, I had fifty cents left and no job. And that was the bleakest time ever for me. I had to face the music, and I, I didn't know what to It was tough. So there wasn't anything that I could see left to do but pack up and take off. I just hit a brick wall. The thing was, at Norman, at that time, any job that was open, the students had a priority. And if it could have any arrangement, whatever could be made for that student to work there, he could work. In Oklahoma City, you're just another hungry guy on the street. There was lots of work, but they wouldn't give you an hour. I go to school till five o'clock. They want you here by four. That's period. That's it. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make any kind of adjustment whatsoever. Uh, for for the students, you're just another hungry gut. That's all there was to it, and that's why I couldn't get any work. So I start packing. Pretty bleak. My roommate came in and said, "What you doing?" I told him. He said, "How much money you got?" I said, you "Got fifty cents." <laughs> How you gonna get home on that? And I said, "Oh, I guess I hitchhiking." Maybe get a job somewhere and work a little on something. How are you going to get your clothes home there? Well, I said, I thought you might be kind enough to leave them here, and then when I get home and make them get a job, I can send for them. That you'd be kind enough to send them to me. He then looked the situation over and turned around and walked out. I thought, well, I guess that's that. I don't know what else he could do. Nothing he can say about it. About 30 minutes later, he and I have a dozen other fellows <coughs> come in and they said, Joe, we're grub staking you. My students. Keeler, Keeler Haney from Durant, said, I paid your room rent. And the other boys were just taking up collection and they gave me, I think, $25, if I remember right. I said, maybe that'll keep you going until you can find a job. You certainly find a job sometime. Well, to 
couldn't let the boys down. You had to get going. They were friends, weren't they? And I start hitting the pavement some more. Getting pretty bedraggled. In the meantime, if I hadn't have been a reasonably pretty good student, uh, I wouldn't have been able to make it, but uh, that was never my problem. Mm -hmm. That was never my problem. Uh, they told me, and I don't know how, to, when I first started down at Norman, they took uh, intelligence IQ tests on us. They were just starting them. They hadn't had them on very long. But they called me back in and got me on the carpet. I wouldn't know where I'd taken that before, and I never had taken it. And they told me that that was the highest IQ that they'd ever seen. What was it? I don't even remember. Really? It didn't mean anything to me at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, uh, I, don't, I don't even remember. But they told me that was the highest IQ they'd ever seen. That didn't mean anything to me. Uh, of course, they didn't take into consideration that these three years I laid out of school and read everything I'd get my hands on. Uh, from all the neighbor women or anybody else, I read everything they had in the library, including the old book of knowledge. Yes. Uh, so I was pretty well educated. Well, anyway, I'm on the street looking for a job. And I look, and I look, I answer everything there is, and I get nowhere. I'd tried to even get a job carrying papers. The man down the papers uh, corner uh, was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were going to get a little rough, but I want to tell you the way it was. And uh, he wouldn't give me a job because he wanted the papers delivered at 4 o'clock. All the high school kids and grade school kids got out at 4. And he didn't want to hang around there to five. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. He was later later on chief of police in the city, so it might have been a good thing that I never got any tickets. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it didn't get nowhere. And I tried everything else, and that would seem to be the only thing that offered any great big hopes. If I could jar him loose, and I didn't. So I went down to the headquarters of the Daily Oklahoma. I had learned that the head of the circulation department, city circulation department, uh, was named Humbarker. And I heard that he was a tyrant. Everybody that worked for him was scared to death of him. But that didn't cut any ice with me that matter. So I went into the office and asked him to, told him I wanted to see Mr. Hombacher. He's got an appointment? No. Well, you can't see him without an appointment. I could see him sitting back in there, his feet up on the desk. Well, I went on out, got thinking about it. The more I thought about it, the matter I got. The next day I went back in, and there he sat back in there. That's and I told him I wanted to see Mr. Hombacher. You got an appointment? No. You can't see him then without it. I said, that's what you think. And I just busted in. <laughs> Blared right on through and all these people in there scattering around about like a bunch of chickens because they felt like I'd come out faster than I went in. And I went in and he slapped his big old feet down on the floor and he said, what are you doing in here? And I said, well, by God, I come in here to get a job. And, uh, well, he said, what the hell? He said, the papers are full of them. What are you coming in here for? Said, Why don't you see? I've got other people hired to take care of these jobs. Why don't you see some of them? I said, yeah, I've seen some of them. And I said, they don't know whether their ass is bored or punched. And I said, uh, I come in to see somebody that knows what the hell is going on and get something done. And he said, well, the papers are full of jobs. Said, Why don't you get a job in some of those? I said, for the very simple reason that they won't give any time or consideration to a student. And that their time won't uh, fit with mine, and I can't go to school on their jobs because they won't give anything. 
He said, where do you go to school? And I said, I go to medical school. He said, what do you mean medical school? I said, I mean the School of Medicine out here, and if you don't believe it, you can call us registrar, you can call Dean Long, either one of them. That's where I go to school. And, uh, well, he said, go out there and see a man out there at the service, at uh, the station. I can't recall his name right now. Could some other time, will maybe for him. And I said, he's one that, I said, he's one of the dumb sons of bitches I was talking about. They don't know what's going on. And uh, he said, what's the matter? Well, I said, I can't get there to deliver papers till 5 o'clock. And he got to have his papers out before, and I said, people don't get home from work till 5. And I'll deliver his papers, plenty of time for him. But I said, he doesn't want to spend that extra hour with them. I know what's the matter, but I said, that's what I mean. He, didn't. he said, sit down. Pretty grumpy. Well, I knew that I had an audience then. And I knew if I ever got an audience, I might get some consideration. And he read my pedigree. Two hours, he talked to me and grilled me. Who I was, where I came from how to get here and what I've done and the whole works till he knew the whole score. And he ended up said, well, Joe, and he's called me by first name. He said, I'll give you a job. And uh, I said, thank you, sir. So he takes his papers and he shuffled around and he said, now go out here to this one, C6 or not C6, but C4. C Station was the name of the station. Yeah. And uh, so he calls the man. I still can't get his name right now. And uh, told him he'd send the man out. He wanted him to take this boy off of this station and give it to me, this line. And the old man told me, he said, now that won't pay you very much money, but I think it'll pay you some. Mm -hmm. He said, you carry it a week and come back in. I said, okay. I carried it a week, I went back in. He said, well, how'd you do? Well, I said, it, it won't do it. I said, I made a dollar. Oh, he said, it'll pay better than that. I said, Mr. Hombacher, here is an enrollment of everybody on that route. Everybody. And who's taking them and who doesn't. I said if I sold every one of them and they paid every week and that was right down through uh, on on 4th Street which of course was dark town mm -hmm. and uh, we call it nigger town. Mm -hmm. We don't do that these days. Anyway I said, if I sold every one of them and collected for every one of them, I'd make four dollars and a half a week. And I said, I can't live on that. And he looked at it and he said, are you sure this is right? And I said, you can go out there and run it yourself if you don't believe it. I know it's right. Well, he said, I won't do it. Well, well. Oh, he left his papers over. Paul Bergman. Bergman is the name, said Roy Bergman, and he was later chief of police in Oklahoma City. Paul Bergman said, uh, I want you to fire this man and give this guy that route, put two of them together. Oh, he fired that man. I got two routes together. I'll go back out. Bergman was fit to be tied because he didn't like the idea of somebody running his station. But he didn't argue with that old man. Yeah. And he said, I knew what was, who was coming. Well, that's right. So I got the two routes on 4th and 5th Street. Went out to the old, almost to where the old fairground used to be down there. I carried them. I lived. I didn't make a lot of money. 
I average around seven and a half, eight dollars a week. Mm -hmm. In those days, I could get by on that. Pretty good. In the meantime, I was trying to get my studies in, which I did. End of the year, I checked back in with Mr. Hombacher, where he, he won me down. I had to go down and see him about every week or two. He was, we were pretty good old buddies. They can say all they want to about him being a tyrant, but I'll guarantee you he was my friend. And uh, we got along mm -hmm. because we didn't mince words with anybody, with each other or anything. We, we shot straight from the shoulder. Well, he said, what you going to do this summer? <coughs> And I said, well, uh, going back out in the harvest field, I guess. I can drive a truck with my uncle and make some money, I think. And he said, what about next year? And I said, well, I hope to find a better job, but I don't know. But he said, I've been watching this route. And I don't know whether he's said that to bait me along or, or what. But he said, I've checked up and said, those routes have paid better this year than they've ever paid in the history of the Daily Oklahoma. So he said, you've done a good job. So he said, if you want a job next fall, come see me. Well, I said, I may do that, but I'll be looking for a better one first. He said, he, we laughed and we went on. Next fall, I'll go back. I wasn't doing any better. I didn't wait till I got so desperate as I did before, and I went back and saw Mr. Homparker. Well, fine, he said, I'll give you those old jobs back. I said, I like heck you will. He said, what's the matter? I said, you told me last year that those job routes paid better than they'd ever paid before, and I said, I deserve a better route, and I want a better route. He said, what route do you want? I said, I want C6. Well, that's the best route out there. And I said, I know it. That's what it is. <laughs> I said, I know it. And he shuffled papers. Scratched his head and shuffled papers some more. And he called Mr. Bergman. <laughs> and he said, fire this guy. Move this guy over to that one. Move this one over to that one. I'm sending a man out to take his route. So I go out to see Mr. Berkman, and he was on the ceiling. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> he said, I knew who was coming. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I got the route. Paid me around $20 a week. Wasn't bad. And we made it out. All right. So uh, that's the way I got through the first two years in medical school. End of that year, he's, Tom Barker said, what you going to do this year? I said, well, I got a job out at Clinton, the TB sanatorium. I can work out there for the summer. How much does it pay? Don't pay very much. Fifty dollars a month, board room and laundry. Well, he said, I, you can't. I don't mind anything. I don't know, but I'm learning some things. It fits in with what I'm learning things. What I learn, that's more education. He said, why don't you go in the newspaper business? Why don't you go into this? He said, well, I'll give you, I, I, I'll fix you up. I'll put you in a station out here. And uh, I never did know, but I've always suspected that he was going to fire Bergman and give me his. <laughs> I've always suspected that. And I told him, I said, now, Dr. Ron Barker, look, I said, I have spent now five years in college working toward a degree. And I said, this is no time to quit that. No, I won't do it. I appreciate it. No end. And I was really appreciated it. So I said, uh, I, I'm. I'd have to turn you down on it, although I know that you'd do exactly what you said, and I might do well, but I said, that's not in line with what I'm working at, and I think I'd be wrong to do it. 
Yeah, he said, I can see your point. So that was that. And uh, I went on, I go, then I get a Lou Wentz loan for that year, my junior year. First time you could get them, or, they, or they, you couldn't get them before you were a junior. I got a Lou Wentz loan. And uh, I got jobs in cafes, which I'd had lots of experience in, cooking uh, and such in cafes. I gave blood transfusions. I did anything else to come along. I, uh, some of the other professors had me work some in their laboratories. And I made out. Uh, it wasn't too bad. And uh, the last year, I asked for a Lou Wentz loan, and they said that uh, they turned me down. They said they thought there's others that needed it worse than I did, but I never did find out who they were. Uh, so I didn't get any loan. However, my sister was teaching then, and she loaned me about $400. And I made it through. Mm -hmm. Graduated then in 1932. I was fifth in the class. So uh, I felt, felt like I'd accomplished something. And I didn't know I owed about eight hundred dollars, but I felt like I could get that paid back, which I did, mm -hmm. and uh, was glad to get it. And Off. where did you start up practice? Your first practice? Well, you had to go to internship first, didn't you? What? You had to do your internship first. Yeah, I went to. Oh, the wait old, a minute. The, I Have went, you got an extra one of these? No. You don't. <laughs> I, I went to, to I the. Or you got to I'm out of tapes. Yeah. I can do that. I went to the old Wesley Hospital, which has later been the Presbyterian. You know. I, I, I went to the old Wesley Hospital, got an internship over there, and started in there. And there's where I met the little brown-eyed beauty in here, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, we, so I took a year there, and then I got uh, uh, the second year as a, a resident, uh, and then we got married, and uh, I decided that uh, the fact is the people down there at Bison got after me, an old friend of mine, and all, wanted me to come out there and practice, they needed some practice. So I went out to Bison. That's where I started my practice at Bison. Started there the first of January in 1934. <coughs> right in the midst of the, pretty much in the midst of the depression, wheat was about 25 cents a bushel, and nobody had any wheat, and uh, everything else accordingly. It was hard times. Everybody's hard. I thought I did well. The first month I collected 120 dollars. Uh, I was living as well as anybody for that matter. I practiced there 34 and 35 and then I got a proposition from the old doctor down at Tologa and down there and take over his practice and uh, after a time and he had a hospital that he hadn't, wasn't using right then, but we might use it later. So I took him up on that, went down to Logan, first to 36. And uh, there's where I run in and made a mistake, because uh, he, the old doctor practiced there for years. He'd been our old family doctor. Everybody liked him. He was a peach of a doctor. So what was his name? Lloyd, Dr. Lloyd. And uh, he was a good doctor, and uh, but what he was working at at the time, he wanted all the cash customers, and I could have all the rest of them. But I was still supposed to be making payments to him, and I couldn't make them. And I told him so. Now, what do you mean the other customers? Huh? What do you mean the other customers? He got the cash customers, and then you got. I got the charge customers. 
and the charge customers went on the books. You didn't get any cash. And uh, so it, finally then Dr. Darwin from here at Woodward came down and wanted to know if I might be interested in coming up there, and I was certainly was. I'd asked Dr. Lloyd, he was supposed to leave out, but at the end of the first year. But at the end of that year, his daughter was teaching school there, and I wasn't uh, uh, dumb enough to know all the rules, hardly. So he asked me if it would be all right if he'd stay on for two or three months yet, till the daughter's school was out. Yes, I was giving that was okay. But that mean I, I broke my contract. See, the con we didn't have a contract then. So he didn't leave. So I asked him when he was going to leave. He said he didn't know he might not leave at all. He sort of liked it, you know. So he might not leave at all. Well, I realized then that I was stuck. So uh, when Dr. Darwin came along and asked me about that, well, I immediately came up and looked around. Got a house. He told me I could get a house, and it's hard to get find houses. I might better rent a house if I could, which I did. And I went in and told Dr. Lloyd. I said, "Come the first of August, I'm moving out." Well, he said, "What are you going to do about all this bill?" I said, "That's up to you. You, uh, you didn't uh, move out." You don't give me a chance to make my payments, so I just walk out, and it's yours. And uh, that's what I did. And, uh, well, he could have probably taken the court, I suppose, but he didn't, because he couldn't get blood out of a turnip, so he didn't take it to court, and he didn't. But uh, I had the last laugh out of that one, and it wasn't a laugh. Come income tax time, I claimed uh, a loss for my experience down there. And the income tax people naturally come check up about that. I gave them the dope. That's the last I heard of well, Dr. Lloyd never spoke to me again after that, so I'm sure that wasn't the last he heard about it. <laughs> so uh, we, we had always been friends and all, but from then on he was never my friend. Mm -hmm. He was a good doctor, and, uh, but he was a pretty tough businessman and, and it didn't work out that way. Well, that was that. I moved up here in 39 and I practiced here ever since that time, except the time I was in the service. Tell me about that. And how? When did you join the service? Okay. Uh, they, they set up the program, of course, uh, different towns and cities and counties of who would be available and who wouldn't, and I was put on the available list, so I get these greetings, you will <laughs> do something about this, you know, uh, in uh, uh, 1942. I went and applied for a commission in the Navy and got it, and uh, reported for duty in the Navy down at the Naval Hospital at Norman on December the 7th. 1942, one year after December the 7th, 1941. And I reported for duty there in the Navy, at the Navy Hospital. I served some time there, and first of the next year, of the 43, they sent me to Bethesda, Maryland, for chemical warfare training, which uh, sort of clued me in that. I wasn't going to be spending all the time in the hospital. I wouldn't need any chemical warfare training in there. And then they transferred me over to the first, over to the 
Naval Air Training Center there from the hospital just across the creek. But they got their, had their orders screwed up. So I served a month or two and then they got the orders uh, straightened up, found out that I should have gone down to uh, Purcell, Lexington, to the Naval Air Training uh, Air Gunnery School. So I went down there. So then the first of 1944, I get orders to go to the Marine Corps. And uh, I uh, had to go to San Diego and Camp Elliott, and from there on up to Camp Pendleton, where they started me in, uh, making up the 5th Marine Division. And I was assigned as battalion surgeon of the 1st Battalion of the 27th Regiment of the 5th Marine Division. And we took our training there, moved on into Hawaii and her staging area, and from there went to Iwo Jima. I was, I went into Iwo Jima uh, in the third wave, D-Day, H-Hour, minus two, plus two <laughs> minutes, two minutes from H-Hour. So it's pretty tough going. I lasted 72 hours until I caught a slug in my knee. And uh, that, of course, took me out. And uh, I managed to wheedle my way around through the, all the ropes and so on, get back into the uh, hospital in Honolulu, flew me back. Let me, uh, now this was at Iwo Jima? Iwo Jima. Well, you won the first invasion? I was on the first wave, the second wave. I was the second wave, D-Day minus two. When you were going in, what were your thoughts about hitting the beach in Iwo Jima? Uh, I expect about like everybody else, this may be it. I never had in my own mind any fears whatsoever about coming out. I just. Uh, I, I never had, I, I never felt like I was going to, I was certain of two things. One, that I was going to be scared, and uh, the other, that I might, well, get hit, be a casualty, but I never had any fears whatsoever about whether I would live or not. The greatest fear I had, and I think that's the greatest fear that every man in the bunch had, that had not been in combat before, and the majority of them had not, was, am I going to be so scared I can't do my job? That's the greatest fear I had. And it soon dawned on me that that was something real. I didn't get off of the beach <coughs> to the corner until Wounded man called. I went over. He had been hit with some shrapnel in his back, and uh, so I take my shovel and dig a ditch and roll him into it on his belly, and get out a K bar to try to get his clothes off, where I could get down to the wound. And I was shaking so much I couldn't hardly hit the man, let alone the place I ought to be going. And I thought, well, that's, this is it. I, I don't know whether I can do my work or not. I can't do my work shaking around, shivering like that. And then it took it out of me. The mortar shell came in, as close as from me to you, buried us, both of us, me and the casualty, completely. It upset the whole terrain. I scrambled out of there. And uh, in the meantime, the casualty was scrambling. He was on uh, to get it off me. I'm sorry, he could breathe and everything. He looked up at me, this Marine, grinned, said, I was pretty damn close, wasn't it, Doc? <laughs> I said, yeah, a little too close for me. But the strangest thing that went through my mind, what am I worrying about? If I get hit, I'll never know it. 
it'll be here before I ever know it. What am I worrying about? And from then on, I was as steady as I am now. Throughout the whole time. From then Thomas, on. Now, what did you do when Iwo Jima with some experiences that happened to you? What did you do on the beach? What did I do? Yeah, you talked about the one casualty. What else did you do? Okay. We had a point uh, picked out, uh, uh, which uh, was an old Japanese uh, uh, gun emplacement where we were to meet and set up our first uh, uh, aid station. My assistant battalion surgeon, uh, I, I didn't want to bring him in, uh, but then it's have to. He should have been in my place in this, this first wave, and I should have been in his place back in the fifth wave. But I knew he didn't have it and couldn't do it. So he'd been sent to me without training and uh, was not ready for that. And I couldn't get him ready for it. And so I'd taken his place and uh, thought maybe by the time he got there, things would be under control. So I went, got up to that place. One of the first things I did, the major was standing over there chewing gum, executive officer, and my mouth was so dry as if it had been lined with blotting paper. And I asked the major for a stick of gum, which he gave me. Don't ever go into combat without some gum because <laughs> you need something to wet your mouth with. And uh, then I went on and saw this patient that I mentioned, and from then on, up to the point, place where we were, our aid station was to be. My, some of my corpsmen were already there and had things uh, getting in order, set up our aid station, and had patients around, which they were patching up and bandaging up and so on. And that's where we set up our aid station. And <coughs> we were, the, car, or the major had told me to, stay there until he gave me orders to where to go next, which I did all day long. The next morning we got the orders to move up. During the day, one of the most spectacular of all, you see so many of them you don't, you can't, it's hard to pick out one, but the supply officer and his sergeant coming back from up on the line to the beach to get supplies, made a run in there and sit down in this place where I was. I had about a <coughs> foot to two foot of concrete around. There had been a 20 millimeter uh, boat gun knocked out. There's dead Japs in there. And uh, it was an overhanging ledge of this concrete and we scooted in under that to sort of protection, and uh, with the Japs built that, they knew where it was and they could hit it. And uh, this officer, lieutenant, and his uh, sergeant dropped in beside me to just to rest on the way back. Sergeant sitting right next to me and the lieutenant next over. And they had much more than got down until yeah, just two shots, just like that, that close. One right over there hit one of my corpsmen, took his head off. The other one hit right between the sergeant and the lieutenant. I caught the sergeant in my lap. The lieutenant went over there on the bank, blew him over there. The sergeant had been taking a wound in his hip that had gone through and cut the femoral artery. And believe me, that can bleed. So I was very busy packing that in to get that bleeding stopped. The corpsman had run over to take care of the lieutenant, and he said, Doc, he's got a sucking chest wound. Well, I said, get him opened up where I can get to him. In the meantime, I got two or three battle dressings jammed down in there hard to 
control this bleeding, turned him over to a corpsman and rushed over to where the lieutenant was, and we carried large safety pins just for that purpose. With the, and there, and there he was with a big wound in his chest. And when he'd want to breathe, the air would go in there and sit in here. And he couldn't get air like he should. And he was as black as your hat. I grabbed him, closed it together, and took that big safety pin and pinned him shut. <coughs> and he could breathe. He said, "God, Doc, that feels better." <laughs> <laughs> he lived. I know. <coughs> Because when I was wounded and taken out on the hospital ship, there he was in the bunk above me, and he and I rode back to Saipan to get him. And that was four or five days later. So he was in good shape. They patched him up, and he was in good shape, so I know he lived. I don't know what happened to the uh, sergeant. How long were you on, Iwo Jima? <coughs> I was wounded 72 hours within a relatively few minutes after I got on there, after I was on there. They took me out to the ship, and as I said, I wheedled my way. I sort of got it in my mind that I was going to write my own ticket as far as I could. They took me out there, and the old doctor on board ship said, well, I see they're shooting doctors. I told him, yeah, they don't. Have pay my debt to, and he let one know how I was. And I told him the main thing I was cold. I, it was about 40 degrees and misting, and that's cold. I'm, well, especially when you run around with the dungarees on and no heavy clothes. So he took me into the old pharmacy room, put me in a bunk there. Said, "How'd you like to have a hot?" Brandy toddy, and I said, I think that would go good. And he mixed up one and said, Looks pretty good. I just mixed one for himself. Oh. <laughs> so, visited with me a little. And then the, the next morning he came to me and he said, How would you like to go over to the hospital ship? They're going down to Guam. We were supposed to go to Guam after the combat. I said, That's fine. That's, that's that's just great. So sent me the hospital ship. Well, I knew nobody but basket cases were supposed to go to the hospital ship. Basket cases and doctors. <laughs> so they sent me to the hospital ship. And I knew that I was out of out of position, but that's that's where I wanted to go and I told them so. Get on the hospital ship and they put me to bed and uh, just got on the bunk when they come in with the, the lieutenant, moving him, transferring him in, and put him in that bunk above me and he spoke to me and we visited. A uh, lady come along. She was a reporter. She was, uh, had heard that a battalion surgeon was brought aboard and she sure did want to interview him. Uh, she was uh, writing. I saw her name several times. I don't recall it. She was writing for Time Life magazine. Had lots of articles in Time Life magazine back then. And uh, she said she wanted to go up on the front line to an aid station. And I said, "That's you're just crazy as hell. You don't want to go up on the front line to an aid station. That you sure don't want to do. Because sometimes." That aid station was in front of the front line. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> anyway, as she was about to leave, she said, What can I do for you? And the thought suddenly struck me. A very good friend of mine, ours, lived here, lived right across the street from me, Cooper West. And he had just gotten his commission and was on one of these ships. I knew the ship number and so on like that. And I knew that he would be having small boats come from his ship bringing patients over to this. Mm -hmm. So I told her this and I said I would like to get a message across to him because I know he'd like to know how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. 
And so I wrote out the message. She took it to the office of the day and he rewrote it and transcribed it so there wouldn't be no chance for code on it. And when the small boat come in, they hand it to him and Cooper got a message. So it scared Cooper to death because he knew nobody was supposed to be over there but basket cases. And I was in bad shape or I wouldn't be there. <laughs> he got the word back to home, scared all the folks from home too, but then <laughs> they got the word before I could get the word to him. Anyway, uh, Cooper didn't take into effect count that a doctor and an officer can get places where other people can't mm -hmm. under those circumstances. So they took me back to Saipan. I was uh, the only doctor they had there as a patient. So I was sort of cock of the walk there. All the officers, even up to the general, came in and visit with me, talk with me about how things were going on up there. I, and that's fine. Took me to the operating room, got the slug out of my knee. I was coming along in pretty good shape. They asked me, uh, if they want, uh, uh, then they told me, said we got word that you, your outfit is not going to Guam. Shot up too bad. They're going to take you back to Hawaii, rebuild you back there. You want to go back to Hawaii? And I said, yes, yeah, sure do. Well, we got a plane going out tomorrow, and uh, casualties, you know. You want to go on? I said, I sure do. Well, the doctor said, well, then nobody but litter cases can go. I said, hell, I can't walk step. <laughs> I, was, I was going all over the places on crutches. And he laughed. He knew what the score was. <laughs> said, well, they'll, they'll be here for a litter to you at 1 o'clock tomorrow. After you. Back to litter up. I was laying on the bed, very peaceful. They came in very carefully and carried me out, took me over and put me on the plane. <laughs> I got to walk just as well. <laughs> took off. Got off of the plane, got up in the air, and I looked down out of my bunk, and there was a casual down in the uh, floor. They had the whole thing full. And he was black as your hat. And, I, and, and somebody was next to him, some of the other patients said, somebody better do something to him. And I realized, and I rolled out of this bunk and got over there and hollered for the nurse and uh, to get some oxygen back there fast. She came up tearing back there, got the oxygen on the boy, and got him coming out. He had a had a belly wound, and he should never have been put on an air transport with a belly wound. But he'd been, uh, he was there anyway. Uh, we got him under control and going, and then she suddenly realized that I was a patient. And there I was down there <laughs> taking care of it. And they go, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going along for the ride. <laughs> and she looked, and you're a doctor too. Yeah, sure. And so she was glad to have me along, though, because between her and I, we had to give that guy oxygen all the way back to Honolulu. And I could help her a lot and, and so on. So I told her there wasn't anything too much wrong with me, just my knee. I get along all right. Had a Marine uh, lieutenant there with an arm all shot up. So he and I were the only officers aboard as casualties. We get into Honolulu, take us up to the old Big Red Hospital about 8 o'clock at night, and they line us up and start signing these guys. You go to B-29, B-29. I was on B-29 and I said, wait a minute, what is this B-29? And they, I knew doggone well they was wrong because uh, all the uh, men were, enlisted men were being sent down there and I wasn't supposed to be down there. So uh, they said, uh, well that's for sick person down and they looked at mine and said, oh my God, and he's a doctor too. <laughs> I said, yeah, my friend here. I said, Besides that, I said, we're hungry. We haven't had anything to eat. Okay, stand by, and they took it down fed us and put us up on BOQ, uh, or SOQ, they call it, sick officer's quarters. Well, I knew I didn't belong up there, 
too, but then that's he's trying to make up for the other who he uh, put us up there. And the next next day they transferred the lieutenant out. But there I was sitting up there among the brass. Uh, commanders and lieutenant commanders and admirals and anybody was sick. Lieutenant Plank, Lieutenant Colonel Plank came in. He was a executive officer in our battalion or regiment. He had another wound. Purple Heart Louie, they called him. He had so many Purple Hearts he couldn't carry them. <laughs> Every time he went near combat, he, 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 he got wounded. <coughs> Sent him over to North Africa just for observation, he got wounded. And, uh, but there he was again, another wound. Of course, I was real well acquainted with him. He was in their regiment, and I knew him very well. We had our visits. The most interesting person to run into was a Lieutenant Colonel Donovan. He was a submarine commander, and uh, he was the the commander of the submarine that went along the Japanese coast and watched the horse races through his periscope. <laughs> and uh, he'd come back into Honolulu to restock up and get everything going. Got out there in a jeep and had a jeep wreck and broke his leg. <laughs> And there he was in the hospital, and uh, not very happy about it at that. So he, uh, he and I visited quite a little bit. About the second day or so after I was there, Colonel Plank told me, said, I just got bad news, he said Colonel Butler's killed. Colonel Butler was my commanding officer in my battalion. Finest gentleman that ever walked. Never knew a finer man in my whole life, and uh, so uh, we were sitting there in the ward room and shooting the bull that morning, and I was talking to Colonel Donovan. Told him I just got some awful bad news. My commanding officer had been killed on Iwo. All these boys, of course, want to talk to us about Iwo. Any of us is up there. Colonel Plank and I were the only ones right then and out of there. And, uh, well, he said, that right? He said, who, uh, who was he, your commanding officer? And I said, Colonel Butler. And he said, not Black Jack Butler. And I said, well, I never heard him call that, but he could have been, because his name was John A. Butler. I never heard him call that. He said, Annapolis of 37. And I said, yes, Annapolis of 37. That old boy broke down and cried. He said, I never knew a man finer fellow than Jack Butler. He was my classmate. And I could agree with him. He was a fine fellow. Anyway, get out of there and work my way back, pull on strings, get an air ride when nobody else could get them. I air ride back to Hawaii and uh, <laughs> Get in the camp there. Fact is, I go back to ship me out of the hospital. Raining, mud everywhere. Sent us down there to. Uh, We've enjoyed it. Sending me out there in these old tents, in the mud up to your knees, and uh, but I reported in and the. Clerk there said, oh, he said, we just got another doctor in. I said, who's that? And they said, French. Well, French had been sent in the, to re, uh, support me I, when I was hit on Evo. He had graduated out of internship in November, and here it was in February up on the front line with that much training, none whatever comes in there and what I do and I the first thing do dig a hole and when be have you a foxhole. And uh, before he got his foxhole dug, I was hit. So he was battalion surgeon. Mm. I didn't know what had happened to him. <coughs> but I hadn't been gone fifteen minutes till he got hit. Uh, bullet went through his thigh. 
not hurt bad, but took him out. So there he was. But I asked the girl, I said, don't you have something in the ward room up in the building rather than these old muddy tents? Oh, yeah, I said, here's one, just, just leave it out. Well, I said, sign it up. And I said, put French in there with me, too, both of them. Okay. So I go down to the tent where French was, greased him, and he was pretty well moping around that a guy goes out and gets half killed and said, and they bring us back and put us into this kind of situation. I said, well, just, if you haven't unpacked, don't. I said, I've got a room for you. And so we went and took us up to, into the main uh, hospital and uh, had a ward room, which was in warm and dry, and we was in pretty good shape. And the major liked to flip when he found out he had to stay down in the tent, and I had a room. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't defer to it. Anyway, we got into, got back then to Hawaii, down to Hilo, got a, as I said, I finagled a trip on the plane to get French and I back. Went back up, got a ride that, back out to Camuela where the headquarters were. Went in to, and reported in for duty. And uh, they had a new, uh, Division surgeon, the one they'd had there before, he knew something about what was going on, the other and didn't. So I was glad to see him out. So I reported in to him. He said, well, I can put you back where you were. And I said, no, I don't want back where I was. Uh, I said, these younger bucks, I was the oldest man in the outfit. I said, these younger bucks ought to be down there on that front line, not me. He said, where do you want? I said, I want the medical battalion. I want D Company or E Company. They made up the division hospital in the background. They stayed back where the general was. And if the general could stay there, I could. <laughs> and that's where I was. He said, OK. And he signed me in French both up back there. So I go back to the medical battalion. I walk in. And the medical officer there, I knew him real well. And uh, he was sitting there working his head down over some papers at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I reported in. I said, Lieutenant Durer reporting for duty, sir, which was very proper. He scribbled another line and suddenly it soaked in on him. And he took, threw his head up and he said, Durer, he said, we heard you were dead. I said, not quite. <laughs> well, he said, that's all the reports been around here. Everybody had the word that you were just out. I said, nope. nope. Who was he? What was his name? Huh? What was his name? I can't call his name right off. Uh, I can't call his name right off. Anyway, he jumped up. All this big office, I don't know, 50, 75 people working now. He said, close it up. Lock it up. <laughs> Open the bar. Everybody take a holiday. <laughs> so he just shut down the whole battalion. They opened up the bar and the party started. <laughs> and I had a party. They had a party for me. It was, it was a doozy. <laughs> and uh, so he was very happy. Ended up, I was uh, put in as uh, commanding officer of Company D. I had numerous other jobs. I was chemical warfare officer, I was a transportation officer, I don't know what all. Uh, 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 oh yes, and I was a uh, 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 war souvenir officer. Got all sorts of war souvenirs in there that we could pass out to these boys and so on later on. And uh, we go then, there where our next, our next combat was scheduled for a landing at Sasebo in Japan. That was our next combat. The invasion. The invasion of the mainland of Japan. Well, fortunately they did a little atomizing over there and that kind of put a stop to that business. So we didn't have to make that. But they moved us on into Japan 
as occupation forces in exactly the same place, in the same formation as we were supposed to go on our invasion. And we went to Sasebo, Japan, and as occupation. The first, and they wasn't sure how we might be received because we were the first Marine division uh, outfit to come in as occupation forces, and Japs didn't. They, they thought they were devil marines are pretty rough customers. But the uh, Jap civilians accepted us real well. In fact, is in a very short time, why everybody's friendly, happy, got along all right, never had any problems there. We, uh, we, uh, we stayed there then. I moved in there in September. We were on, on the way out there when MacArthur signed the treaty. On. Moved on in September, enter time there, and then in December I get uh, the uh, message that uh, uh, our outfit was to be sent home. There's another one of the screwy deals. Navy could, I'm sure the Army too, but. They could get more things screwed up and you couldn't figure out how to happen. You wonder how you ever won a war. But anyway, I had orders to take my battery, my, my company, down to a certain place to, to board ship, which I did early one morning. We get down there and driving up and riding up in our convoy. Loudspeaker was calling for me. I went to the headquarters. Your orders have been canceled. You're not going to go on that ship. And, uh, well, in the meantime, I'd sent all my uh, records, Corwin such out on that ship with the records, everything. Well, what ship are you going to go on? I don't know. Well, I said, you better find something because. I've got a company of men back here that's going to be on the war path. <laughs> I promise you that. So we sat around there two or three hours, cooling our heels, and finally some boats come in said they're going to take us to our ship. And we loaded up, took it about 10, 15 miles back over to Wharf, where we'd just left before. And I let my exec, I told my exec, to take the men aboard and tell them that we didn't have orders to present, but we presumed they'd be there. And I wanted to, took one of the boats, and I told them that in the beginning, I was going to commandeer one of those boats, go back to the ship, pick up my records, and McCormick over there. And that was a regimental headquarters, so maybe they could tell me where, where my orders were. They didn't have them. They didn't know. Meantime, the ship's officers hauled the port uh, authority and everybody else. They didn't know. When I come back, got all my records on board, got all loaded up, no orders. When are you leaving? I'm going to leave in the morning. Well, okay. Come morning, we left. I still didn't have any orders. I brought the whole company back to the United States without orders. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> You're probably the only unit that did that. <laughs> My wife had seen in the paper and the news and such that the battalion or the regiment, the division, 5th Division was coming back to Camp Pendleton. She called out there and they told her that Company D uh, was not coming. They didn't have any orders either. Mm -hmm. Well, we got into San Diego, and the ship's exec officer, he was he he was getting quite antsy because there he had a whole bunch of men with no authority to do anything about it. And he said, "I hope they unload us at the dock." Well, fortunately, they did. And he told me, he said, "I want you to have your men on the deck." And when that gangplank hits the deck. I want them off here as fast as they can get off. <laughs> and we went off on the dock. There was a convoy over there, and I went over to the commander. I said, this 
this going to Pendleton, this waiting for us. Yeah, I guess so. Get on. So we boarded the, the convoy, and they got held up because it had a big explosion on the road. And we didn't get in to, to camp then Pendleton until about 9 o'clock that night. All of us hungry. No orders. No knowledge that we was coming. I told them that I were here. I want some barracks for my men, and I want some food for my men, and I want some food for myself, and so on. And I rode him a little rough shot, and we got him fixed up. And uh, I don't know. I never did know. Still don't know what happened. Nevertheless, we got orders then. There's other things to go in. We. Uh, uh, since we didn't have any orders, the post order was that half of the men had to stay aboard. And this was just the 22nd of December. We left, incidentally, we left uh, Japan on December the 7th again <laughs> of 1945. And December the 7th is sort of an anniversary for me. But here it was, the 22nd of December, just before Christmas. All these men, including me, wanted time off for Christmas. And the post order was that half of the men had to stay aboard. And the other guys were all saying, what are you going to do? And I said, my men are taking a vacation. They're taking short leave. You can do whatever you want to do, but my men are taking leave. And I let them all go. Except, I told the boys, I called them up, told them I had to have, I wanted to, a couple of guys to stand stand uh, with, the, with the barracks. So instead of taking uh, 48, I wanted two men to take 24 and two others to take 24. Mm -hmm. And the other men, all the rest of them, have 48s. So a couple of the boys come up and said, look, we're not going to have any Christmas till we get home. So we'll just take the 48 and stay aboard and let all of them go. So they all take off. And they all come back, except one was brought him in out of the brig. He's pretty battered up. <laughs> he got a little over the deep end, got crossed up with some of the local yokels. Pretty well battered up. And they brought him in to me to hold for court martial, summary court martial. Well, I thought, now well, that's a hell of a way to go. I'm not going to stay around here and hold him for some court martial, and he ain't either. <laughs> but the next morning, we get orders that 24 hours later, the whole battalion or whole the company would go to San Diego for the uh, transmission to, uh, to get out. And I also had my orders to go and start my procedure to get home. So I told, called the young fellow up, and I told him, I said, now, I don't know what they're going to do. His name is on the list, see, in the, the, the roster to go. And I said, uh, you have everything ready to go when that convoy gets up here. And if they haven't picked you up before, then you get on that convoy. The first one, <laughs> and when that convoy moves out, I'm through with you. I said, they may pick you up and bring you back. But when the time comes for summary court martial, if they haven't gotten by then, you and me both going to be out. They can have, they can, let's see what they can do about that. Well, I never heard anything about it, so I guess he got along all right. <laughs> <laughs> so did you return to Woodward then after your discharge? Oh, that's some more of the crazy uh, Navy stuff. I have to go down to San Diego, the naval base down there, transfer back from the Marine Corps to the Navy. Well, uh, to get all my records back into the Navy. And then when they get all of that done, they say, okay, your separation center is Memphis. Well, I said, why can't you turn me loose here and let you, just let me go home from here? Well, if you had a job or a, 
automobile that you had to ride, take back, we could do that. Well, I said, I haven't got a job. I don't want a job. I don't have an automobile. If you give me 30 minutes, I'll get one. <laughs> they said, no, we can't do that. So <coughs> here I go, get on the train, go right through Clinton, <laughs> clear on Oklahoma City to Memphis, get out, get separated, turn right around, come back to Clinton, <laughs> get, come home. <laughs> so that's just some more of the crazy stuff, but that's the way it goes. And uh, so, okay, fine, I drew mileage on it, so mm -hmm. I, why should I cry? The last thing I'd like to get, the tornado. What? The tornado. Tornado. Well, what do you want on that? I've talked so damn much on that tornado business. I get tired of it, I guess. I was been on too many records. Oh, uh, but. Well, where were you when the tornado hit? Okay, I. <coughs> I'd worked hard all that day. I had a heavy day, and uh, I didn't get out of the office until late. Mm -hmm. It was nearly dark. I had to make a house call, and I went to make this house call, and the man came to the door to about to leave and said, looks like it's going to be a storm. I said, yeah, I'll probably blow your hat off. Well, it just blew his house about two-thirds of the way off the foundation and crumpled it over like an old shoebox, but none of them were hurt. From there I went home, and I got home tired and hungry. They'd been working on our, doing some shingling and such on our house, and no supper. We're going out to eat. I wasn't in a very damn good mood about that. <laughs> there, but if I wanted to eat, that's what we we're gonna do. So we get loaded up to go, and just about the time I get loaded up, the boy happened to think that he didn't have his funny book. So he had to rush back in the house to get his funny book, and I'd warned him time and time again that uh, I was gonna go off and leave him, and this time I did. So he had to go back in the house and stay there, and we went downtown uh, to uh, Gill's Cafe then, which is right across the street from where the old post office was. Mm -hmm. Katie's had a cafe there for several years. But in there, I turned in my order, and uh, it was getting pretty stormy. I heard Gil say, one of the boys, Gil, said, my God, look at that barometer. About that time the lights went out so I couldn't see the barometer. I went to the window and I, then I could hear it singing. And they have a peculiar hum. I've been in many tornadoes before, in around and close to them. And uh, so I go back and I shouted out to the people in there, including my wife and daughter, get down under the tables. There's a tornado. Get down under the tables and stay there. I don't know how many of them did, and no one, wife and daughter did. I went back to the window, and just as I got back, the window went out. And I say out, not, not in. There wasn't a fleck of that hit me. Sucked out. And, uh, I could see that we were in it. <coughs> the most peculiar thing, which I have stated more times than one, looking up the street west from there, is about three feet, it looked like a solid flame across the street, which um, I figured out was due to rocks and nails and bits of metal and such striking the pavement, and it was uh, sparks from those. But uh, no sooner said than done, it was over. I went back and told the family, so everybody asked, I said, it's all over now, I don't know no words to worry about that. And uh, so uh, we, wife and daughter got up and I said, well, we better head for home. There was a boy at home. I was a little bit concerned about him, naturally. 
Gil said, hollered at me and said, Doc, don't go out there, it's hot wire. And I said, hell, there ain't a hot wire in town. Uh, I knew darn well that all the wires and power plants and everything else was out. And uh, anyway, we went on out. Car on each side of my car was crushed, both of them. Mine wasn't. I got in the car, backed out, went home, driving over all kinds of rubbles, and, uh, what have you. Don't know how can we got by without getting a puncture, but it didn't. Found out the boy had been down in the basement, fixed him some supper, and didn't even know anything had happened. Didn't even blow a shingle off of our house. We was out, out of the line of it. So well, everything was all right and we felt better. I still hadn't any supper. <laughs> but I told my wife, I said, I better get to the hospital because I know we're going to have some patients. And I took off to the hospital. And uh, I got out to the hospital. Dr. Darwin and Dr. England were patching up a fellow's face. <clears throat> They'd been cut up with some limbs and such right near the hospital. The hospital hadn't been touched. It was well out of the field of the other. And I told him, I said, you better get on the ball because you're going to have more customers than you know what to do with. And they said, well, certainly not that bad, is it, Doc? And I said, just took off the west side of town, that's all. They couldn't believe it. But I hadn't more than said it. The door came open and it never went shut again. And the people began flocking in there, bringing them in, carrying them in, any way they could get them in, over and over after. And was this putting them in the neighboring houses, and every, out on the porch, everywhere else. Was this a hospital down on, what, 4th Street? 4th or down Street, down? yes. Okay. Yes. The hospital. I always felt we were fortunate. There was not a doctor or a nurse injured. They were all able, except Dr. Tedrow, and he was sick, but he had not injured, to report for duty. So I think we were fortunate in that respect. Well, the people come in, what can we do, what can we do, and no organization. Well, that's not what they have now, you know. No organization, what can we do? So. We had to sign them whatever come to mind at the time, and so on. As hired boatman, the brother and a lawyer here, my old partner in the hamburger joint, bus boatman, asked me what to do, and I suddenly dawned on me. I said, Howard, there's a number of dead people around here, and they're just taking up space. I said, Get you another some other man or two and a pickup or something like that and take them to the morgue. And he said, okay, and he got after it. And uh, my wife, graduate nurse, and she'd gotten out there by that time and was working. And uh, uh, Howard came in and my wife told her there was a baby under the bed. And <laughs> he he pretty queasy about that, getting that dead baby out and under the bed and carrying it down there. But he, Got by with it, took it on out. I don't know how many they took out. Uh, I counted 12 at one time, around uh, laid out in the yard and around there. But anyway, that helped out some. And uh, we were all so busy, you'd forget about your own feelings, you might say. Finally, Hope Van Nostrum, her name's Owen now came along as she probably had before. I don't know, but she didn't know what she could do, and it dawned on me. I said, Hope, do you know where the kitchen is? And she said, Yes. Well, I said, Why in the heck don't you get down there and make some coffee for mm -hmm. these folks around here mm -hmm. that can take it? Boy, she could do that. And then she came up with better ideas. She had some other men and some men told them to go down and see if they couldn't find some rolls and things like that, and they went down to the old bakery, and it was all uh, front caved in and out, and nobody there. They walked in through the banged out windows and picked up boxes of hot rolls, sweet rolls, 
brought in donuts, brought them out. So we had, began to have coffee and donuts along about midnight mm -hmm. when we could eat and work at the same time, you know. Sip a cup of coffee and take a bite of donut and go on working. So that helped out some. About uh, somewhere at about, I'd say, two, one, two, or three o'clock, I got a call from the Santa Fe Railroad and they wanted to know if we could use a train. I told them we sure could. Uh, they take it, take out a train load. And then we got a call from the <coughs> Army. I don't know if they could use some planes to transfer patients. I told them yes, we could. And uh, so they began to get those things out, but they didn't get to. Uh, uh, they seemed to all come at once. Of course, the hospital was loaded, but they had uh, the community buildings and the churches, what have you, downtown, were also filled up with patients all over the place. And uh, the old Oasis Steakhouse been blown completely off of the pavement, and they used that. It was a temporary morgue. I think they said one time they counted 24, 25 people that they had. Just call it and laid them up there, you know. There's mm -hmm. nothing they can do for them to get them out yeah. where they could be taken care of later. Anyway, it was about early in the morning sometime. I'm not sure. Daylight or thereabouts or later. Till it seemed like they all come in at once. The planes and the trains. And we loaded out, I think they said it was two or three large planes, as well as a train of about six or seven cars, and we loaded them full within 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that took, began to take some of the... Was this injured? Injured. That began to take some of the pressure off of the local group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, then uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon, some doctors from Wichita came in and said, how long you been here? And I said, since the beginning. Well, they said, you better get home for some, get some rest. I said, I don't think I can rest at home. Well, they said, you'll have work to do when we go home. You better get some rest. I went home, oh. yeah, and uh, but I couldn't rest. I sort of laid around for an hour or two, and uh, wife and I got out and drove around a little and sort of could see what really had happened. Get some better idea in daylight what had happened. Fact is, we went out and got some water uh, because the water was off. And uh, then I went back to the hospital, and I stayed all night long, the rest of the night, and worked. And uh, by that time, we were down to a, a we'd say, a hospital capacity. We had all the surplus out, and just what the hospital could take care of, and, the, and they'd all been pretty well taken out by then. And that was it, as far as, from my standpoint, the medical part mm -hmm. of it. Uh, it was the wounds, the injuries, of course, every kind imaginable, everybody knows about that. And, uh, most uh, uh, outstanding thing about the wounds were the puncture wounds, splinters, all sizes, shapes, well, everybody had splinters. Everybody was rolled in mud. You couldn't even recognize your old mother. She's mud caked. Uh, and uh, of course, when the water went off, that made it a little rough too, with mm -hmm. trying to get the mud off of these people. Mm -hmm. But that was about that. So, um, I guarantee you, when a tornado comes to town, there's going to be some damage done. You don't want them. But I think. 
that uh, our Woodward tornado uh, is a landmark in many respects. The first place is it started the, the civil defense setup that they have today, which if we'd had then, we couldn't have stopped the damage, but I think we might have saved some people. See. How many were killed? I would say that we had at least 2,000 casualties. I know over 700 at the uh, Centro Oklahoma City Hospital. Uh, 100 and I would think their final count was around 105 or something dead. I'm not sure how many of that was. But uh, if they'd had their warning system that we had today, I, it, it undoubtedly would have helped. Uh, another thing that people don't realize, ironically as it may be, from Woodward's standpoint, it's a far better city today than it would have been if they hadn't had the tornado. And as I say, it's somewhat ironic to say that. Why? But that was urban renewal with a vengeance. It cleaned out, took out all of that uh, stuff, downtown stuff, made it so that the downtown area could be begin to expand and they didn't have to take care of this old settler who had lived here since the day one and he didn't want to get rid of that house and they couldn't get him out any other way.